Welcome everyone to our traditional Anzac service. Kent Street Senior High School prides itself on the respect that we show to both past and present serving uh, men and women officers and we do that with the traditional Anzac service. This is different from an assembly. You do not applaud at any stage during the service. I ask you to remain silent until the singing of the national anthem. And we really hold that, hope that you uphold the excellent standards that we set with our Anzac service. Quietly please stand as we welcome the official party. Thank you. Our hosts today are Denzel and Olivia, and I'll ask Denzel to begin proceedings. Uh, good morning, honored guests, Major Dwayne Nurse, Australian Army. Mr. Gilbert Moore, PNC President, Mr. David Holt, School Board Representative, Ms. Kate Wilson, Principal, Kent Street Senior High School, Ms. Hel Helena Reichel, Mr. Craig Lynch, and Mr. Phil Holbert, Deputy Principals, Ms. Marilyn Harvey, Manager, Corporate Services, Staff, Parents, and Students. Welcome to Kent Street Senior High School's Anzac Day Service. Chad Sullivan will now present the acknowledgement of country. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here today? The Wajak Noongar people and pass on my respect to the elders past and present and emerging. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. On Sunday, I have the privilege to represent Kent Street Senior High School at an Anzac Day service at the Victoria Park Memorial. This will be my speech. I'm honoured here to be invited. I'm honoured to be invited here today to represent the students of Kent Street Senior High School. As I stand here to commemorate Anzac Day and remember the 50,000 Australians who were sent to Gallipoli in 1915. My thoughts turn in particular to the many young people who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Although 18 was the minimum legal age 
for enlistment, many of the records show that a number of young men under the age of 18 served at Gallipoli. The youngest known was just 14 years and 9 months when he died. His name was James Martin and he was the youngest Australian to serve in World War I. It is very hard to imagine the equivalent of a year 10 student on the front line when the closest 14 year olds today will get to battles is online or in virtual worlds. Thanks to the brave men like James, our generation can enjoy the benefits, freedoms and opportunities of living in a peaceful and free country. Learning about the path, past and the ritual of remembrance is important and lessons can be learned. Times have changed considerably and today new and more equal opportunities exist for different groups in society. Approximately 18% of current Australian Defence Force is made up of women. Viable career opportunities exist for people of all ages, genders and backgrounds within the ADF. Much to the delight of my classmates within the aviation program of Kent Street Senior High School. The significance of today is about showing respect and gratitude to the past and current Defence Force members who have made and continue to make personal sacrifice to keep us safe. High school students are privileged to be able to engage in education of, of the past. This builds our understanding about the traditions, facts and folklore of Anzac Day. The many real life stories, sacrifices and heroism of everyday Australians will not be lost, but be handed down to future generations. To the past, present Defence Force personnel and your families, on behalf of Kent Street Senior High School, we say thank you. Our guest speaker today is a great friend of our school. Major Dwayne Nurse is an ex-student of Kent Street Senior High School, who has achieved success in the fields of education and the Defense Force. He is the Christ Church Grammar School Coordinator of Army Cadets and a talented teacher. Major Nurse also serves as a part-time Army officer with the Australian Army and was deployed in Operation COVID-19 Assist during the months of April and May. His deployment was part of the Western Australian and Federal Government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. During deployment, Major Nurse served as a company commander and was responsible for the military component of regional checkpoints, managing over 100 Army and Navy personnel and conducting liaison with the Western Australia Police Force. It is my great pleasure to ask Major Nurse to address the school. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. To the principal, Ms. Kate Wilson, to the traditional landowners, guests, staff and students. I really appreciate being uh, welcomed back to speak to you all today on the eve of the 106th uh, day of Anzac commemorations. Shortly we will have a minute silence to remember and if you are at a loss as to what to think about, hopefully something I convey here can give you uh, something uh, to reflect on during that time. I've been informed that the theme for today's service is the 10th Light Horse, which is one of the most famous regiments in Australian military history. And I've been privileged to spend most of my military career with the 10th, including deploying overseas with them and commanding the unit for three years. The 10th Light Horse is uniquely Western Australian. The unit wears the state colours of gold over black and the state's animal emblem, the black swan, with pride. And each soldier that's passed through the ranks of the 10th Light Horse is cognizant of what these symbols represent, their country, their state and their people, and therefore the heritage of the unit belongs to all West Australians. And it's easy to spot a light horseman, they have an emu plume tucked into their slap chat. And this custom started with troopers proving their horse riding skills by chasing down running emus, ripping tail feathers out and wearing them as a badge. Don't ask me, I don't know how to ride a horse. But when World War I broke out in 1914, the young Australian democracy was in lockstep with the British Empire and the enthusiasm to enlist was infectious. Men of the city flocked to the infantry battalions and skilled riders from rural Western Australia were so great in number that Western Australia uh, raised its own regiment, designated the 10th Australian Light Horse. And if you are from a long-standing farming community in the southwest and you reside in the Rotary 
residential college, chances are your relatives were amongst the original ranks. The Tethlock Force wasn't involved in the initial Gallipoli landing on the 25th of April. Perth's 11th Infantry Battalion was one of the first units onto the beach and they fought well. But despite much sacrifice, the Gallipoli campaign descended into trench warfare and deadlock. Months after landing, troops tried to break the stalemate through the August offensive, and this was planned and more troops were needed, and the Light Horse Brigade were called upon from Egypt to reinforce the offensive without their horses owing to the terrain, which was not suited to mount the manoeuvre. This upset the men as close bonds are formed between trooper and horse, but despite this, they were keen to prove their worth in battle. The Battle of Lone Pine on the 6th of August was the first assault of this August offensive, and it was a tactical victory for the Allies, but the losses were catastrophic. In four days, 2,700 Australians were killed, including West Australians from the 11th Battalion, and approximately 6,000 Turkish soldiers perished in counter-attacks trying to retake the position. All of this for the loss. All of this loss for a 150 metre advance over a 300 metre front, a tiny area of land. But Light Horse's part in the offensive was to attack over an even smaller piece of ground called the Neck on the 7th of August. And it was the size of three tennis courts. And while the Light Horsemen waited, they could hear the Battle of Lone Pine raging through the night, but they were encouraged that the Australians had achieved a breakthrough into the Turkish positions. They also believed that the Turkish forces were distracted enough by reinforcing Lone Pine, and that would make their attack on the Neck easier how long they were. At night, on the 7th of August, the Light Horsemen steeled themselves. It would be a frontal assault on Turkish positions in four waves, with the 8th Light Horse from Victoria in the first and second waves, followed up by the 10th Light Horse in the third and fourth. H hour was 0.430 in the morning. And as the men waited, the Navy shelled the Turkish positions. However, the failure to synchronise watches meant that the barrage stopped at 0.423. And the men waited for the refock for the final burst from the heavy guns, but it never came. And the Turkish soldiers reoccupied their trenches, and the ominous sound of machine guns being test fired meant that the element of surprise had been lost. After no direction from high command, the commanding officer of the 8th blew his whistle, and at 04.30, the first wave of the 8th flight was charged, only to be immediately cut down by machine gun fire. In 30 seconds, not a man was left standing. The second wave took up their positions. They didn't have time to make sense of the horror unfolding around them. Before two minutes had passed, the whistle blew again, and the second wave of the eighth charged forward, hampered by their dead and wounded comrades on the ground and in the trench. And again, men were torn to pieces by gunfire and few got further than ten paces. In less than five minutes, the eighth wave of horse ceased to exist. Then came the turn of the tenth. They occupied the front trenches to form the third wave. The scene would have been pitiful, with dead men clogging the trenches, stretcher bearers squeezing through, and the wounded pleading for help. The tank's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Brazier, went to headquarters to appeal for the attack to be stopped. The men sensed and reassured each other that no one would send the third wave out, and in a heated argument, Brazier was told unequivocally to continue with the attack. When he got back to the four trenches, every man looked anxiously towards their commanding officer. Brazier solemnly stated, I'm sorry lads, but your order is to go. The West Australians braced themselves to meet their fate, scribbling final messages home, ritually placing keepsakes in the footholds of the trench wall, quietly praying and saying their final farewells to their mates. And the men of the tent, having witnessed the eighth before them, went over to be met by even heavier fire as the Turkish positions around the neck were already alerted to the commotion below. The result was the same with men mown down by over a dozen Turkish machine guns and rifle fire. Brazier appealed to high command again and he persuaded the brigade commander to stop the attack. And in the confusion, half of the fourth wave misinterpreted the order and also went over to meet the same fate. The men of the Light Horse suffered immeasurably. It was a slaughter. And it forever scarred a few survivors, but is remembered as one of the bravest, but regrettably the most futile acts of the war. And the August offensive itself joined a long list of military failures of the First World War. So why do we, as Western Australians, remember this tragedy? Charles Bean, the official war correspondent for Australia, wrote a poignant eulogy to the Tenth Light Horse in the official history of the First World War. And he stated, 
With that regiment went the flower of the youth of Western Australia, sons of the old pioneering families, youngsters, in some cases two or three from the same home, men known and popular, the best loved leaders in sport and work in the West. Bean highlights the loss to the West Australian community and makes inference to the losses of potential amongst all these young men. How many would have grown up to be caring husbands, born their own children, and lived happy, productive lives? Too many family trees in Western Australia have a stunted branch that bore no fruit. And Bean captures this sentiment in relation to the Tenth Life Wars at the neck, but we are cognizant this applies to all losses in all wars. We also remember tragedy in order not to repeat it. Even though the Allies won the First World War, it is remembered as a colossal waste of human life. It is hard to find a more obvious example than the 80 killed and 58 wounded from the Templar horse, who attacked the neck despite the certain outcome for no gain at all. It is a microcosm of the wider war experience contained in a small area rather than continents, and in a short time rather than years. And men who survived the charge at the neck, as scarred as they were, fought on in the war, but they developed a scepticism and were not afraid in voicing their objections if they thought lives were to be thrown away in futile attacks. And this no doubt saved lives and resulted in the tenth being a highly effective unit which took part in the Palestine campaign between 1916 and 1918. And the tenth Light Horse is the only unit in Australian military history to receive the surrender of the capital city with the capture of Damascus which is in turmoil to this date. But this scepticism that was developed not only served the soldiers of the 10th, but it has slowly permeated through our Australian identity. In relation to remembering our Anzacs, this is extremely important. The Australian government need to present a strong case to the Australian people before they send soldiers to a conflict. And we, as a nation, will not tolerate unnecessary loss. In fact, Parliament House in Canberra has a unique design feature to facilitate this. The Cabinet Meeting Room, where decisions to send Australians to overseas on operations are made, has a very large window at the end, and this window looks down Anzac Parade to the Australian War Memorial. And this national symbol, dedicated to our war dead, in plain sight, reminds members of Parliament that their decisions do indeed have consequences. So my humble opinion, that is why we remember the neck. Not to celebrate war, not to glorify it, not to justify dying for an abstract ideal, but to remember that each soldier sent to fight in any war has potential to contribute to their community and that, well, that their lives should not be spent in vain. This is why we remember. Let's work together. Thank you, Major Nurse. Scottish-born singer, songwriter Eric Boggle emigrated to Australia in 1969 and a few years later penned his most famous song about the 1915 landing in Gallipoli. Written during the times of the Vietnam War, the song was initially a protest song but has since evolved into one of the most recognised songs about the war of our generation. We will now listen to and the band played Waltzing Matilda. Now when I was a young man, I carried my pack And I lived the free life of the rover From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback I waltzed my Matilda all over And in 1915, my country said son it's time to stop rambling, there's work to be done. So they gave me a tin hat, and they gave me a gun. And they sent me away to the war. And the band played waltzing Matilda. As the ship pulled away from the quay. With all the tears, flag waving and cheers, we sail off for Gallipoli. Well, I remember that terrible day when our blood stained the sand and the water, and 
town, in the hell that I call Souvlave. We were butchered like lambs at the slaughter. Johnny Turk, he was ready, oh, he primed himself well. He rained us with bullets, and he showered us with shell. And in five minutes flat, we were all blown to hell. Nearly blew us back home to Australia. And the band played waltzing Matilda. When we stopped to bury our slain, we buried ours, and the Turks bury there. Then it started all over again. They collected the wounded, the crippled, the maimed, and they've shipped us back home to Australia. The legless, the blind, the insane, those proud, wounded heroes of Suvla. And when the ship pulled into Circular Key, I looked at the place where my legs used to be. And thank Christ, there was no one there waiting for me. I see the old man, all tired, stiff and sore, the weary old heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays one single time. the call but as year follows year more old men disappear someday no one will march there at all flowers have always played a major part in Anzac Day tradition the Australian Returned Soldiers and Sailors Imperial League, the forerunner to the RSL, first sold copies for Armistice Day in 1921. For this drive, the League imported one million silk copies made in French orphanages. Today, the RSL continues to sell copies for Remembrance Day to raise funds for its welfare work. A floral wreath will now be laid by Major Nurse and Miss Wilson, who will also perform the official parade in memory of the past and present service men and women who fought so bravely in all of the many conflicts Australia has faced. Thank you all. The Ode comes from For, For the Fallen, a poem by the English poet and writer Lawrence Vinnan. It was first published in London newspaper The Times on the 21st of September 1914. The verse, which became the Ode of Remembrance, has been used in association 
with commemoration services in Australia since 1921. Please remember that as a sign of respect, it is traditional that the audience respond to this poem by saying, we will remember them upon its completion. Can I ask Major Nurse to please come forward and present the ode? Can you please be upstanding? They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. Over the next few minutes, you will hear the playing of the last post. Historically, this has been used to signify the end of the day. The last post is played during commemorative ceremonies to serve as a tribute to the dead. This will be followed by a minute of silence for personal reflection and will be immediately followed by the playing of the rouse. The rouse, or reveille, is played to signify waking up to a new day. This, in turn, will then be followed by our national anthem. Please sing along to our national anthem with great pride and remembrance. Please stand silently as a sign of respect.
standing while we, uh, as the official party, leave the service. That will be followed by the Camouflage Party. Please be seated. Can I begin by saying how impressed I was with everyone's behaviour and their excellent manners and etiquette this show. That was absolutely fabulous, so well done. Um, can I acknowledge the members of the Catap Catapult Party? Firstly, even though they have left us, the cadets who were on the side was Horia Staninescu and Harris Clark. The corporals who were at the flag was Ian Lestrilla, Ty Carmichael, Charlie Murphy and Joel Pedu, and the warrant officer leading the way is Russell Pereira. All of those students are members of the Air Force cadets, and I know we do have other uh, cadets in other, air, um, other armed, form, armed forces. If you are interested, then you could talk to any of those, in particular probably Russell, if you would like to join. But they always do a fabulous job and that was terrific. When we move back to homeroom, I'll ask you to collect your bags and then you'll go to period one. And just a reminder, we're on whole school assembly. So at the end of period one, we'll be recess. 